Um, I would guess for this session you would expect me to talk about methods and processes and systems, and I'm going to talk about that a bit, but I want to start by talking about um, the X factor that makes this work, uh, which is the amazing people who work in healthcare. So um, to mix up my television programmes, not so much Britain's Got Talent, but Bolton's Got Talent, maybe. Um, and here are some of the people who are making it work. Um, this is the team from our stroke unit, um, consultants, nurses, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, ward clerks, um, housekeepers. You'll see, if you're um, careful to spot it, a couple of interlopers, because that's me and Roger Boyle, who's the National Clinical Director for Stroke Services, meeting with the team. If you go back just two and a half years, this was probably the most demoralised group of staff in my hospital, because they knew that the quality of service that we're delivering was substandard. Patients were getting a bad deal, and patients were dying unnecessarily. And two years on, they've transformed the service. They've done it themselves with support from our BICS team, support from our external Sensei, but it's been the staff in that team that have done it. And, and the results are great. Um, here are some of the results. Um, two years ago, only 46% of patients got a CT scan within 24 hours. That's now 100%. In fact, it's now almost 100% in four hours. Um, we didn't even have an acute stroke unit. Um, patients coming in acutely ill with a stroke could be spread across a dozen medical wards. Patients, only two thirds of them getting aspirin in 24 hours. Poor uh, performance in terms of physio and other issues. And for colleagues from outside of, of the UK, there's something called the Sentinel Audit that's done every two years, which the Royal College of Physicians run which is a Kerr bundle, the eight key interventions that all stroke patients need. And at that time, we were below the 75th percentile, so we were in the bottom quarter of the country. Um, you'll see the results in 2008 have improved dramatically, and we're now actually in the top 2% of the country of stroke units. And you can see the results in terms of lives saved. Mortality, standardised mortality down from 122 to below 100 and falling. And actually, I'm been a bit hard on them in terms of that length of stay, because that's the length of stay reduction since we opened the acute stroke ward on the acute stroke ward. Before we had an acute stroke ward, the length of stay for stroke patients was 43 days, and that was the average. So the quality and the productivity potential here is immense, and as you've seen from the photograph of the staff, the implications for morale are immense as well. Um, this is the Royal Bolton Hospital. Um, anybody ever been to Bolton? Well, those who've been will know this is the nicest bit of the hospital on the sunniest day we could find. Um, <laughs> it's not all like that. And in fact, my oldest building was the original workhouse built in 1858, still with patients in it. And we've got buildings from every era in between. So we're not a lean design. And if you go back four or five years, we certainly weren't a lean hospital. We're not yet, by the way. <laughs> we're far from it. I'll come on to that. But four or five years ago, we had a lot of problems. Very long elective waiting times, um, lots and lots of long waits in our emergency department, a very big deficit, including a 14 million cash debt, historic cash debt, and some real safety, quality, governance issues, and a group of clinicians who, frankly, just weren't engaged. So um, we embarked on thinking, how do we change this? We were looking for an operating model, a system that could drive quality and productivity improvement at the same time. And I was fortunate not just to know Dan, but also to hear John Toussaint from Thedica speak about the work he'd done. And I had one of those light bulb moments, we're, we're going to use lean. I came back to the hospital and said we we're going to use lean, which was the end of 2006. So we are very, very early on our lean journey. We are three and a half years in. And as I explain, we think we've got a huge amount to learn. At the start, we thought this was going to be pretty straightforward. We pretty quickly realised it wasn't. Um, but here are some, some of the early results, and, and they are encouraging early results, but they're in pockets, the small pockets of excellence where we've been able to redesign end-to-end -end patient journeys. But in trauma, um, fraction neck of femur, 31% reduction in mortality rates. Again, the mortality was higher than it should have been in the first place, but a 33% reduction in length of stay, and what really pleased the staff, a 42% reduction in the paperwork. Everybody was filling out their own forms. We just brought them all together. I've mentioned the stroke results already. Ophthalmology, redesigning the service 
for the patient's convenience, not ours, reducing the number of patient visits to hospital by 50% early achiever of the 18-week target, a year ahead of schedule, actually. Um, this is a scurry one. High-risk joint replacements, hips and knees, mostly in older people with complex comorbidities, an 85% reduction in the complication rate. So how bad were we before? And by the way, we didn't even know. We thought the service was okay before we drilled down and really learned to see the problems that we had. Pathology and the same in radiology, big speed up in the turnaround time for tests. When I got to Bolton, I had a little, I don't know what the collective noun is for pathologists. Somebody might tell me, a little specimen of pathologists came to see me. Um, for three million pounds, Mr. Fillingham, an extension to the laboratory could be yours because it was overflowing with specimens and samples and people. 40% floor space saving. And we haven't gone, I don't think, anything like as far as CEDACA in, in releasing cashable benefit, but real cost savings out, particularly in some of the support areas, laundry, estates, finance and others, which has more than paid for the cash outlay on the programme many times over. And one of our key indicators, our staff engaged, we've now had 30% of our 3,500 staff involved in at least one week-long rapid improvement event, many in multiple events. And that's across the board. That's including consultant staff and it's including, in fact, my directors all do two events each a year. And I'll talk a bit more about our green training because we recognise that we need to supplement events with a, an education and training approach. And that's actually now up to about 1,500 staff. So about two thirds of our staff have either been through an event or have had the initial training. So that's encouraging, but we think we've only scratched the surface. We've spent three and a half years learning how to do this, getting some interesting results that we've gone along, but the potential is enormous. We are trying to be Toyota-like, not just in applying the methods, but also in learning how Toyota manage, how they lead, how they involve every member of staff, trying to turn every member of staff into a problem solver every single day. But not long into this, one of my general surgeons, one of my senior consultants, took me to one side, and he wasn't being difficult, he was trying to help. He put an arm around my shoulder in a kind of the avuncular way that senior consultants have. He said, you see, David, he said two things. First of all, we're not Japanese, and secondly, we don't make cars, <laughs> which is, is true, clearly. Now, whilst Dan was right to say, um, there's a lot about healthcare that isn't different and lean can apply and deliver results. I think we mustn't forget that there are things about it that are different. Um, first of all, we're not factories, we're hospitals. And patients aren't our raw materials, they're our guests. In fact, the way Don Berwick from IHI puts it is he says, we are guests in our patients' lives. I'll come back to that because if we're not careful, we can use lean to dramatically improve our processes and the patient's experience not change one job. If a car manufacturing company gets it wrong, of course that can have very serious consequences, but most often the windscreen wipers don't quite work as they should. We get it wrong in our business, there's quite a high probability that those errors will lead to avoidable suffering and death. And we have, as a professional culture, a whole host of professional subcultures, and we have to find a way of working with the grain of those professional subcultures. And finally, this is a really interesting bit, I think. If you um, helicopter back and think not just of the hospital, but of health and our local healthcare system, our true north goal should be to put the hospital out of business. Once you start to think about health in lean terms, what's the biggest waste in the system? The biggest waste in the system is somebody falling ill when they didn't need to fall ill, coming into hospital if they didn't need to come into hospital. So our true north goal is to stop people coming to my hospital. I do wish somebody to get rid of payment by results though, it's very inconvenient for that true north goal. So we came to the view that what we weren't trying to do was just use lean to improve a few processes or to generate a bit of efficiency or even improve safety. What we were trying to do was work out how we could engage the whole hospital in a 20 year plus journey of transformation that would hopefully would change the way the hospital was run forever. That's what we're trying to do. We started on about five years, then 10, certainly going to see me through to retirement, I'm hoping. Although, again, as I'll say at the end, I think we're at a point where we need to deepen and accelerate the spread of these methods pretty quickly, especially with the view, in view of the challenges we're going to face from uh, the end to the growth in NHS spending from 2011 on. So, um, how are we doing that? Well, you can look at this in two ways. Um, all chief executives are trained that when you really don't know what to do, you should have a five-point plan 
So here's a five point plan. Um, as a student of Lean, maybe there are five questions rather than a five point plan. And then I've got some reflections and lessons at the end. So how do we change people's mindsets? How do we redesign every end to end process through the hospital? How do we make it not a project or a program or an initiative, but something that we do every day? How do we embed it in the warp and weft of the culture? And then how do we get out beyond the hospital? How do we create this lean health and social care system? That's what I'm going to talk us through over the next 20 minutes or so. So, challenging the old mindsets. Um, I think a lot of the work of hospitals and a lot of the work of hospital executives in the, in the NHS particularly, I don't know what it's like in other systems, is driven from outside. whole set of top-down, externally driven targets, four hours, 18 weeks. And frontline staff are pretty sceptical about that. Um, sometimes they're the manager's targets. If they're feeling charitable towards me, they're the government's targets. But there isn't an awful lot of ownership of them. And when you think about how we solve problems in the NHS, it's not been very lean. So most of the time we ignore the problems. If we just simply can't ignore them, we pass them up to the manager. And we get a whole group of people who don't really know the job, call managers. We remove them from the workplace and put them in a meeting room. In fact, if it's a really serious problem, we take them off site into a hotel. <laughs> we, try, we deprive them of data and we, we swap anecdotes. And then people throw out solutions and we go with the solution of the most important person in the room. And that's, your organisations won't be like that. I'm, I'm absolutely sure your organisations aren't like that. Um, and there are many times that we are still like that. And what we're trying to do is create a different kind of culture. A culture where everybody from the front line up is setting their own goals and their own measures for improvement. Where we don't work around the problems, but we get to the root causes and we solve them. Where we have not just a few leaders at board level, but leaders right throughout the organisation who are constantly going to the game, they're going to see what's happening. And where we, we have a management process that's based on data and that's based on the scientific method and that's respectful towards both our customers and the people who work in the organisation. That's what we're trying to do, but it doesn't always feel easy. Now, health warning on the next slide, I'd, I'd like to say this is based on systematic scientific research, but I made it up, so just so you, you know that before you see it. This is Fillingham's motivational matrix. <laughs> now, this is, this, is a, this is a party game for you to play, play at home with your friends, neighbours, work colleagues, put them in these boxes. I like, I like two by two matrices. So on the bottom axis, we've got grip on reality, high and low. And then on the vertical axis, outlook on life, positive and negative. So over in the bottom right hand box, the embittered cynics. These are the people who um, don't really know what's going on and don't care, but it's all horrible and I hate it. Um, these are the people who, well, actually, Mr. Fillingham, we tried that in 1989 and it didn't work. It didn't work. Um, and when you present them with data, they say, that's not my data. Um, embittered cynics. Now, I think we made the mistake of thinking we've got a lot of those. I think they're a very, very small proportion. And usually they've had, and I don't mean this funnily, but people usually have, they've had some kind of traumatic life event that's, that's embittered them. And, and actually, it's very hard to change them. And they need to pursue their career development somewhere else, essentially. The problem we've got is we've got a lot of people masquerading as embittered cynics who are actually disillusioned skeptics. They're the people who are not fed up because they don't know what's going on. They're fed up because they do know what's going on. So they joined the NHS in the top right-hand box. They joined as naive idealists. That's why people go into medicine and nursing and healthcare management. They want to do good. But what we found was during their training, during working in a hospital, it got driven out of them because the record's never there when I want them, because you can't get my patient to theatre on time because we've done yet another drug error through a misadministration of drugs, because we got patients batched, queuing back up in the waiting room, in the emergency room, and they're getting a bad deal. And that disillusions people. It drives the optimism and passion out of them. And what we need are people up in the top left-hand box. We need enthusiastic pragmatists, people who are honest, who've got a grip on reality, who look at the problems, they don't shrink away from them, they stir them in the face, but they carry on being optimistic about solving them. They keep up the enthusiasm and the passion. And what we're trying to do in Bolton is use lean to generate enthusiastic pragmatists. We've got to convert the skeptics. And there's a bit of a risk here at this point, because you hear a lot of people who say, oh, lean's only a little about the tools, it's, it's mostly about culture. And then what they do is they abandon the tools and they go off and run organisational development events and hold hands and say, couldn't it all be better? 
and, and big lesson for me in the last three and a half years is if you, it's, it's an interesting kind of dilemma this. If you use the tools really rigorously, that changes the culture. So using the tools really rigorously is a non-negotiable. You need convincing data, and that will usually convince the skeptics but not the cynics, and you cannot be hands-on experience through rapid improvement events. Rapid improvement events are not the be-all and end-all, but as a vehicle for generating positive change, cultural change, they can be incredibly powerful. But if you do that, and you then have your middle managers saying, don't care what you did on that improvement event, this is how we're doing it, it doesn't work. So you have to fundamentally change your leadership style and your management system to reinforce it. I'll just give you one example of a converted skeptic. Um, probably shouldn't name him, but I will. Brian, who's one of our respiratory physicians, um, who's, again, a senior consultant, didn't quite put his arm around my shoulder, but is a known skeptic, massive skeptic in the organisation. And we've had real problems with his service, so we persuaded him to do a rapid improvement event. And the first day, he was sat with his arms folded, don't know why I'm here, looking at my watch. By day two, he was starting to listen. Day three, he's running around the organisation. And by day five, he's persuaded his consultant colleagues to change their job plans, which I've been trying to do for two years, incidentally. And a month later, he stood up in the canteen in front of 200 staff. And he meant this as a compliment. But what he actually said was, this is the first thing in a 20-year career management, I've ever seen management do anything that's any use at all. <laughs> but because Brian said it, that had a massive influence on his colleagues. So those converted skeptics are really, really important. So changing those mindsets is the first thing we've got to do. The second thing we've got to do is redesign every end-to-end -end process in the hospital. So that's OK then, that's straightforward. Um, I don't even know how many there are. Um, we've redesigned 14 end-to-end -end patient journeys, um, many of the multiple pass-throughs. And the results I showed before are really those journeys where we've done multiple pass-throughs, where we've got really good results. And we've redesigned 20 support processes, everything from pathology and radiology to the switchboard to the laundry. So redesigning every end-to-end -end process is critical. And we're doing that using what we call BICs. So we steal shamelessly, you will have noticed, in Bolton. I don't pay fees if I can avoid it. And John Tassant has been very good to us. We've had two teams out to visit Thedica, and you'll see some similarities in the approach. And um, um, they've got the Thedica improvement system. We've got BICs, which everybody calls it in the organisation now, the Bolton Improving Care System. Um, and at the heart of that are the four big aims of the hospital. Very simple, improved health for people who live in Bolton and surrounding areas, best possible care for patients and families, value for taxpayers' money, joy and pride in, in work for the people who work for us. That's what we're about. And I'll come back to that um, when I talk about our policy deployment approach later. And we work through a cycle. It's a PDCA cycle. How do we really understand what's of value to the patients? Because unless we know what patients value, how do we know what's waste? And that's about the experience as much as it is about the outcome. Learning to see, using the full range of lean tools, then redesigning the care process, and then, and this is the really tough bit, is delivering benefit, is actually grinding it out week after week, month after month. And we do that by building in a series of, I won't run through all of this because um, you're all interested in lean in the room, you'll be aware of what the lean toolkit is, but getting away from batching and backlog queues, getting the service to flow, reducing variation and complexity, getting proper visual management in place, trying to build that in every time we redesign a patient journey, every time we redesign a support process. And I'm going to very quickly talk you through a practical example. So I've shown you the stroke results already. You know what we've achieved. How do we do it? Well, this is where we were back in 2005 6 I've already said some of this uh, before. And we started by, as you do, nice long value stream map on lots of bits of brown paper, really good impact at, at the out brief. And we created a plan. Um, and again, a big message, I think, is a lot of people get rapidly into rapid improvement events, but unless they're to do something, people get very frustrated. So knowing that you've got a plan to transform the stroke service and then using your rapid improvement events to deliver that plan works much better. Um, so there is our future state, the team's future state. And incidentally, these aren't my slides. These are the slides of our stroke matron, Suzanne Lomax, um, from a presentation that she gave, because they've led this work. And this is their version of that lean redesign for the stroke uh, 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 patients, direct admission from A&E, um, trying to get the CT done as close to A&E as possible, successing the area. And because they successed the area, they were able to create a hyper-acute unit, uh, which we hadn't had before. 
pull systems using board rounds and, and better discharge planning, um, and making sure that our bed management systems get all of the patients that need to be on the ward onto the ward. We decluttered, we got rid of the waste. Simple stuff, anybody in the room who's been involved with productive ward and so on will know of these kind of, of techniques. And the waste was everywhere. I mean, it was endemic. It was, you were falling over it. You didn't need to loop for it. And that's it after. Nice story, this. I went to visit the team after they'd done this, and it was done by a healthcare assistant and a storekeeper, who were not the two highest paid people in my hospital. And they were so proud of this. And I said, this is great, but how are you going to sustain it? Thinking I might get, they might say, standard work, Mr. Fillingham, or we're going to audit it. <laughs> and the housekeeper looked at me with a glint in her eye, and she said, they'll have to answer to me if they mess this up. <laughs> um, so a whole range of standard work. And incidentally, this team did 15 rapid improvement events over a two-year period to realise this future state, uh, with a lot of work in between. A lot of the success and other work was done in between. And they used events to build standard work as well as to problem solve, to do those kinds of things, to create flow. Um, so each of these was, was, a, was a rapid improvement event, involving obviously not just the stroke team, but people across the whole journey from A&E to radiology to social services to colleagues in the community. And that's Suzanne, because they're her slides, um, and, it's, and it's her work. And building visual management in right throughout that pathway. That's, I think she stood in front of the information board, but they have visual management techniques right across that world, right across that pathway. And that's given people a real buzz. And that's the key, because unless the people want to do it, it will not work. So, um, redesigning every end-to-end -end process, that's fine. How do we then sustain it? How do we build it in and make it the way we manage every day? Well, we've, the last 18 months, been using Toyota's approach to um, performance management, to setting objectives, to cascading those throughout the organisation, policy deployment. I'll say a word about that in a minute. Trying to link that through a system of mission control and information centres to our improvement activity, and then building it into daily work. And that starts with those True North goals that I talked about before. And for each of those, we have, um, this is a policy deployment matrix, so down at 12 o'clock at the bottom, those are the five-year stretch goals for the hospital. Up at, um, I can never get work this out without looking at my watch, up at 9 o'clock, we've got the annual targets for the trust, and then up at 12 o'clock, that's the improvement initiative. This was last year's. We've actually managed to get the number of improvement initiatives down from 12 to 8. Although I have a feeling people have just kind of consolidated them rather than really trying to focus down onto priorities. Uh, and then metrics at 3 o'clock. And then the, the, if you could see it, and you can see it in some detail, I'm sure, on the web. When it's on the web, you can blow it up and have a look. In yellow... That's me and my executive team, so we know exactly who's accountable. That's the business plan of, of the hospital onto a side of A4, A3. Rather. And the key then is getting that on, is using that process of catch ball to really engage divisions, departments, and individual staff members in what the goals are. So policy deployment, critical to embedding this in the mainstream business plan of the hospital. And then using mission control and information centres to link those improvement work streams to the key aims, to the things we need to deliver. And we're now trying to embed that right down at the level of the ward and the clinic. Um, people in the room been involved in productive ward? How many people have done productive ward? Quite a few. Well, not everybody. We've taken productive ward and combined it with a few other things, um, with nursing quality framework and with lean daily work. And we're rolling that out now right across the trust, but rolling it into non-clinical departments as well. And these are some of the kind of performance metrics, again, that the teams themselves are using right down at ward level to say, is this ward working the way that it should? Um, and in some parts of the hospital, and I would say this is limited, and I was very envious of John's video as to how daily problem solving is working in Sedica. In, in some parts of the hospital, we're just now starting to see that happen. Our Lean Blood Sciences Lab were probably the first department in the hospital to really get lean. It's very scientific. They're scientists. They love it. And they're doing proper daily problem solving with proper root cause analysis, the team themselves solving as much as they can, elevating to the supervisor things that are cross-functional problems. 
And again, stealing, acknowledging, at least I acknowledge when I steal, um, stealing from Thedeker, um, the toll gates approach in Bolton is becoming patient gateways. And I haven't put results with this because it's very much a work in progress. And I, all, I also want to acknowledge the LEA is making hospitals work because I got to see an early draft, so started applying it straight away. And we're putting 80% of our lean effort behind the urgent care pathway this year. And this is critical. Unless we can keep bed occupancy below 90% throughout the winter, we will not deliver. We will not deliver a safe, effective service uh, for, for our patients. And, and the key to that is effective, smooth, timely discharge, and that's about managing the process on the wards. A plan for every patient, reviewed regularly, using the gateways to make sure we're doing what we should do. And the, the, the boost that this has given to multidisciplinary teamwork is immense. I mentioned Brian, the respiratory consultant before, they have now changed their job plans, so there is always a consultant based on the respiratory wards. And there is every day a multidisciplinary team meeting. And the handovers, the nursing handovers, are happening at the bedside. Some nurses have said to me, good, we're going back to that then. And it really works, and the patients love it. The patients are traffic lighted. Are you green, ready to go on your plan day to discharge? Amber, some problems to resolve. Red, we've got serious concerns. And we have patients saying, I don't want to be Amber. Why am I amber? I'll do extra physiotherapy. So engaging the patients in what their status is and getting them to put pressure on the staff to chase the problems. The early indications, and we've only done this on, on a few wards, are a really big impact in terms of reduced length of stay and occupancy rates, but particularly staff morale. Junior doctors are saying, I know what to do. I know what my job is. I never before really knew when I came in for a shift what was going to be expected of me. And there's a team, um, junior doctor, uh, nurse, social worker, having an argument about what the gateways should be, a really heated discussion to thrash it through uh, and work it out. And having got it as daily work, how do they make sure we don't slip back? How do we embed it in our culture? Well, policy deployment and rapid improvement events that I've already mentioned are critical to that. We're now starting to say, so what kind of HR processes would a lean hospital have? For a start, we'd stop recruiting people just, just because they have the technical skills and not ask questions about what kind of attitude have you got and can you work in a team and can you communicate and can you problem solve. So start to build that into recruitment and into who gets promotions. Thinking about developing lean leaders in a different kind of way. The coach, John's slide, the coach looking down the mountain, helping pull the staff back up. And I think, and we're not anywhere near it with this yet, but the really big game is going to be building this into professional education and appraisal. So every nurse, doctor, therapist, as part of their training, is trained not just to care for the patient in front of me, but to improve the system of care for all of my patients. And finally, we're developing what we call our BICS Academy, because what we found was rapid improvement events were fine, but you need to do more. You need to give people the skills, you need to train them. Um, together with, with Simple Consulting, our consulting partners, we've, we've been inventing that curriculum because we didn't find it anywhere suitable for healthcare. So what we've now got is a, a graduated curriculum. Everybody in the hospital does green. Um, you can progress to bronze, to silver, ultimately to gold. I'm told there will be a platinum, unless we recruit Dan, I'm not sure we're going to get anybody to platinum. Um, but we've now had 1,500 people through um, green, 59 graduated at the bronze level, 15 at the silver level. And these are people like uh, my chief pharmacist, like the deputy head of therapies, uh, a HR manager, um, a senior matron. And you can really see the difference for those people who've got that level of depth of understanding. And it's keeping me on my toes because I'm having to keep learning to know what they're talking about. But really to get that depth of understanding of lean skills and then apply it in their own area uh, is really good to see. And again, to celebrate that, this is our, our annual celebration event, awards event, where we celebrated not just the achievements, the improvements in clinical care, but celebrated those people who'd put in the time and effort to learn this and to go through that learning process and become accredited. Final thing I want to talk about, because I think this is really pertinent to 2011 on, is, okay, we're starting to get the hang of this in hospitals, but we've got a long way to go. But patients don't think of the healthcare as being hospitals. They think about it as everything from falling ill, see my GP, into hospital and back out again. And the potential across the whole system is huge because we're not very good, to be honest. We have, certainly in the northwest of England, very high levels of avoidable hospital attendance and admission, massive variations in length of stay, unacceptably high rates of readmission. 
A lot of my patients are elderly. 18% of our elderly patients are readmitted within 28 days. Some of that's clinical deterioration. It's unavoidable. A lot of it's very avoidable. We don't manage people's chronic illnesses well to keep them healthy at all. And we have an unacceptably high rate of errors that lead to harm and indeed even to death. So it could be hugely better. And in Bolton alone, if we could get our emergency admissions, readmission rates and length of stay down just to the national average, we would save enough to meet the savings targets that are being set for 2011 to 2014. And the challenge is, can we use lean to do that? And if we're going to, we need to work across the whole health and social care system. Bolton Primary Care Trust are already using Lean themselves as a framework for commissioning and for their provider services. And together with us, we're jointly redesigning the whole of the journey for urgent care. And I have a vision that just as Tesco's used Lean to come up with their strategy of Tesco Expresses and big Tesco hypermarkets and home shopping, we might do something similar for healthcare. We might say, what would the Lean healthcare system look like? So using Lean to drive the strategy for the future healthcare system, as well as giving us the methods for delivery. And interestingly, I sit on what our LSP, Local Strategic Partnership, which involves local authority, local businesses, healthcare, further education, a wide range of partners working to make Bolton a better place. And we've just had a discussion about Lean, because they're all using it in different ways. The police are using it, the Department of Work and Pensions, the Job Centre Plus are using it, the local authority are using it, we're using it. And it's a real commitment to say, could we use Lean together to improve the services and the lives of people in our community, not just what they get when they come along to the hospital, because we happen to be doing BICs in the hospital. So, just to sum up, um, I think um, it's been a really, really interesting journey for three and a half years. You come to conferences like this and you present the good bits. I have to tell you, we have made lots and lots and lots of mistakes and learned a lot from those mistakes. Um, but there are some big lessons I think that I would take out. I've already said, you've got to apply the tools rigorously, but you have to adapt them creatively for the healthcare context. You've got to maintain constancy of purpose and consistency of, of message. And that's interesting. There's been a recent research study published that says that the average life expectancy of an NHS chief executive in post is 700 days. So I'm, I'm some poor sods going very quickly because I've been there four and a half years. Now, if we're turning, now that's, sometimes that's reorganisation, sometimes it's promotion, it's a whole range of reasons. But if we've got people in post on average two years, how are people going to take this seriously? Uh, we need to follow it through. We need to cultivate those early adopters. We need to celebrate our successes, but they need to be credible, and we need to survive and learn from the setbacks. And I guess a particular challenge for chief execs is the lean transformation stuff is really fun, but if I want to be around to still do it, you have to stay on the pitch. Um, I started by talking about our staff. I'm just going to finish with a quote from a member of staff. The last rapid improvement event we did was introducing patient gateways for our complex elderly care ward, which is an area that doesn't always get a lot of attention. They feel a bit neglected. One of our geriatricians, Dr. Mayan Egby, is really passionate. Again, she came as a real sceptic. And um, our outbriefs are usually quite buzzy and upbeat and fun, and there's a bit of laughter, and, and people find a, an interesting way to present what they've done. And Mayan did it differently. She was very serious, and, and this is what she said at the end. I was in despair, but now I have hope. And she said it very passionately. And I think if we can bring hope to a few geriatricians, a few members of staff, a few patients, then there's got to be something in this. Thank you.